How Technology Has Changed Our Farm and Our Bottom Line. And this will be presented by uh, Christian Hebert, if I pronounce this correctly. Yeah. <laughs> managing partner with uh, Hebert Grain Ventures. Christian is the managing partner at Hebert Grain Ventures, HGV, a 22,000 acre grain and oil seed operation in southeastern Saskatchewan. In addition to his farming background, he is a CPA and has worked for MNP, lots of acronyms here, in a past career. He is the chairman of Global Ag Risk Solution and is a graduate of Texas A&M's The Executive Program for Agriculture Producers, TEPAP. -E -E Christian is also the co-founder of the online platform Work Workhorse Hub, geared towards solving labor issues in agriculture, and co-founder of Maverick Ag Limited, a business risk management and consulting firm focused on insurance and data ana analytics. Danny Kleinfelter of TPAP refers to Christian as one of the most progressive young farmers he knows. Please welcome Christian Hebert. Is this mic on over here? Can we shut it off? Yeah. Okay. How's everyone doing this morning? I can't hear you. It's like coaching six-year-old kids. How's everyone doing this morning? Great. Oh, how's it going, Ron? At least we got one that'll be loud, right? So I hate introductions because really I'm kind of the same as everybody else in the crowd. I really enjoy playing in the dirt. And teachers once told me I wouldn't be able to look out my window every day and not really do much but have a lot of fun. And it's what I get to do. So the other thing is, is I had my five-year-old daughter at a presentation with me one time. She asked, Dad, why do they talk about you so much at the front? I said, I don't know. What do you think they should say, Ivy? Well, Dad, you're bald and funny. So that's really what the intro should be, right? I'm a farmer that lost all his hair and tries to, you know, lead life with optimism because really what the hell else do we have to do? So I call this one return on investment technology in the bottom line, but I put some question marks underneath there. So I like a little bit of participation. So is anybody sick of the word big data words? So you guys either all have broken shoulders or you're liars, right? We're all sick of the word big data, okay? Unicorns, they'll give you 10 more bushels if you use this piece of data or spray this on your crop. To me, it's an issue in farming. So kind of what we've started to focus on on the farm is what we call blackjack farming. So does anybody else like to go to the casino? I'll put my hand up because I do, right? The rest of you, if you say you don't gamble, you're a liar. You put $400 in dirt every spring and hope that it comes out in the fall is 500. That's a lot worse addiction than gambling. Okay. But the thing I like about blackjack is it has odds. So if you go on Google or if you're even at a casino, you can ask for what I call the cheater card. You have a pair of eights, the dealer has a six. Here's what you should do because the odds tilt in your favor. In my mind, that's what we're trying to get out of data. So data is absolutely useless unless it helps us make a decision. And how many, how many farmers in the room, if <clears throat> the way the data came to you was, here's the data set, here's the decision you're trying to make, and if you pick yes, 75% of the time you're right. Does anybody have a hard time making that decision? So for instance, a whole bunch of us are probably have bought or are buying canola seed. If the data came to you and said, here's the varieties that are the best in your area, here's the price differential in, on each variety in your area, but also in every other area in West Canada. And 80% of the time, if you pick these two varieties, they'll out yield everything else and use less nitrogen. Is that a hard decision to make? No, it's an easy one. But instead, with almost every decision we make in farming right now, we get an influx of data, most of it crap. It's either uncalibrated, i.e. the same as all our yield maps for the last 20 years that sit in a binder because they're nicely printed and explained to us, but are out at least 13% on most fields right? Or a marketing campaign of a brand new variety that came out. So I believe data is as much about return on investment, but more about changing our mindset of what are we trying to get out of data? Because right now we're currently letting companies drive the story of data, not farms. And until we start telling them what we want and what it's worth, that's the train we're going to be on, right? Sorry for any companies in the room, but I have a bad filter. So 
Here's why I believe data is important and why I think our mindset should be the utilization of data. Anybody have Netflix in their house? Quite a few people. Anybody walked in a mall and had a millennial run into you watching their iPad with earbuds in because they were down like this? Every single one of us, right? So in 2003, Netflix actually tried to get Blockbuster to buy them. And the board of Blockbuster said, there is no way that streaming video becomes mainstream. Nobody will be walking around with earbuds in their, in their ears and an iPad. And, we, and it's not that they were wrong, because you look at what Blockbuster had done in the 10 years prior to that. You know, VCR to DVD to Blu-ray to no late fees, all weekend rentals. They had changed a lot, right? Does that sound anything like light bars? You know, the steering wheels that you'd break your finger off because it got caught between the rubber spinner and the wheel. Auto steer's a waste of time. Why would I ever put that in there? How does it make my guys be less tired and work two hours later? That's just a selling feature. Sound familiar? Does anyone own an air seeder tractor or a sprayer without auto steer anymore? Not very many of us, or a swather, or even a combine. Agriculture is not much different than exactly where Netflix and Blockbuster were. So what I'm saying is we have to value data, but we have to put ourselves in a position to make future-looking decisions, not blockbuster decisions. So what's your strategy going to be? Oh yeah, and I got the one on the top, right? Most dangerous phrase in agriculture, but it's not just agriculture. It's in every business in the world. We're not unique in agriculture. We pretend we are. Mother Nature's a pain. Try owning four resorts in Mexico. Think it bothers them if it rains? Every bit as much as it does us. Try being a construction company in Vancouver, building high-rises. Think weather affects them? more than us, right? So it doesn't, care, doesn't matter what small business you are, we've always done it this way, is extremely dangerous way to operate your business. So kind of the why behind why we think data is important. I hate slides with that much stuff on them, but my CFO made this and he likes more data than I do, but more or less two groups of data. The first one is if anybody read the Royal Bank Report Farming 4.0, Anyone have a look at that? Came out six or nine months ago. If you haven't, you should have a look at it. So basically it says, what do we need to do in agriculture in the next, you know, 10 years by 2025 in order to move forward? Lots of it was around tech. The other thing, people. So I'm not going to go a whole bunch into people because I'm actually talking about people at three o'clock. And FYI, everybody, if you see this presentation, or you see my, present, my presentation on people, and you ever, it comes across your mind, man, are they moving fast or doing things right? No, we're just less awful. We still are so bad at a whole bunch of stuff, right? And the only reason we've changed is we've made a lot of mistakes. We're all the same, right? We have strengths and weaknesses. You know, we tend to focus on people, yet if you talk to my crew, they just work the most they ever have in the fourth quarter of 2019. So the focus was lost. So don't, everybody, I'm, I'm all about being fairly transparent for everybody to make steps forward. So as this report goes, and also the Texas A&M group, would anyone assume that data and technology actually relies mainly on people? Huh? Is anyone impl- like using tech to use less people or more people? Most people would put their hand up to say technology reduces the amount of people, Right. However, I would say that technology also allows you to grow and have other business ventures within, which then forces you to have more people. And sometimes the easiest way to deal with data and technology is by adding good people, right? I always, I always bug my dad. I don't know if Louis here. He was going to maybe come. His VCR still blinks 12 o'clock. I did say VCR, right? And yet my seven-year-old can outplay me in Farming Simulator on an iPad, So people are pretty good at technology in today's world, right? So some of these little things, it's not that you can't implement tech or data, it's that you don't have have a people strategy, right? And we're bad at delegating. So if you look at at the Texas A&M report, so that's a course I took called TPAP. A few other people in the room have done it. It's fantastic. Look it up. TPAP out of Texas A&M or C-Team in Canada. 
I believe higher education is a big form of utilization da utilizing data just because it forces you to open your mind and look at new possibilities. So Texas A&M, some pretty interesting stats. 50% of producers don't prepare cash flow budgets or track profits and losses in North America. And got to remember, this is out of the TPAC class who have paid approximately five grand US to go down there for a week. So it's not just, it's not what I'd call even average in North America. Out of that group, 50%. 25% of producers do not track key financial ratios, 50% market production with no idea of their cost of production, and less than one third of farms have a goal or a strategic plan set. So those would be what we kind of call the North Star or the plan of where we're going. And I'm saying we need to have one on data, let alone on our whole farm. So that's how I'm gonna start our presentation is this was start of 2019, kind of the strategic plan or the North Star that we set for 2019 at our farm. Um, and as you can see, I'm, I'm pretty transparent with what goes on. So this is flat out what, what we argued and fought and negotiated and came up with in our boardroom. So we wanted to focus one on financial data-driven decisions, i.e. blackjack farming. Let's find a way to have our data become what we call intelligent and more accurate so that we can make a decision on the reason I care about it, Walmart turns their inventory eight times a year and every night or every hour they get a report of what's going through the till of what the most important pieces of inventory are. Unless you're in southern US or South America, like we get one turn per year. So we can only learn once, which means we should be trying to learn 10, 12, 50, 70 times more in a year than Walmart does because they have that much more data coming in. So that's where that part was. Number two, labor power and machinery optimization slash utilization. So if anyone has heard me speak before, this is a pretty key focus for us all the time. So if you kind of break your financials down into, you know, this group of costs is what I call the cost to get it done. Equipment, I don't care if you own it, lease it, custom work, you know, depreciations in there, repairs, supplies, small tools, all your labor costs. So if you're in Argentina, you would get custom work for all of your land. That's pretty normal right? In Canada, I would say it's pretty normal that we own more of our gear. In the U.S., it's pretty normal that they lease in different parts, depending on what the tax law is, and in Canada. But it doesn't matter. It's the cost of getting it done. On a grain farm in Western Canada in 2017 through 2019, the low side of that number that I've seen is $110 an acre, and the high side is over 300 And I'm not taking, you know, a Durham lentil farm versus a you know, a highly intense vegetable or, or certain types of potato farms. I'm saying grain crop to grain crop. That means that the farm with 300 bucks an acre of equipment costs was losing by $180 an acre before they even seeded. And if that's a decision they want to make, that's fine. But I don't think too many people actually believe that, right? I used to joke when I was an accountant, if the, at the bottom of your financial statements, you made 500,000 bucks, but you're $50 an acre inefficient on your labor power machinery. Well, but we still made 500. Roll over to your spouse every morning and tell her if you're a little bit more efficient, you make a million instead of 500. Tell me if it matters. Not even a laugh to that one. Nobody cares about a half million bucks anymore. Right? So that's what that one's about. Three crop input optimization. So I have a personal theory that we handcuff the top 60% of our fields. Maybe if I live somewhere else, i.e. my grandpa's donkey died in a different location than south of Mooseman, I wouldn't have this problem. But, yeah, you laugh at that. How many people farm because that's where the donkey ran out of water? Every single one of you almost, that's why we farm there, right? If you're in the hotel business and you wanted another hotel, would you put it right beside the current hotel or would you look at all the towns around that have lots of people and not enough hotels? We all know the answer to that. What's the first thing we think of when we're going to buy land? My wife jokes, Christian doesn't want more land unless it touches anything he farms. It makes a lot of sense, right? That's just farming mentality versus business, right? But on the, what I mean by crop input optimization on that top 60% is, for instance, if I feel 60% of a field can run 80 bushels an acre for canola, that means I need 240 pounds of nitrogen. It's pretty reasonable math, right? And the other 40% of my field I think can only run... 
31, then there's a different way to manage that, right? And I might not think it can run 80 every year. It might depend on how the water supply is that year. So then I need to make live decisions. So we'll talk about that. And then fourth, you know, we, we've got this hanging on the wall at the farm. It's called can't isn't an option. It's a challenge. And really what we're talking about there is kind of the values that your farm lives by. And this is one of them for us. Um, sometimes I would say it's a negative because it comes across as we're pretty stubborn as a group, but I think that having values that your team believes in is pretty important when you're trying to drive culture and drive strategy. And I'll talk about it more this afternoon. So how many people in the rooms filed taxes for more or less your whole career? For everybody that didn't put up your hand, CRA is looking for you, okay? Everybody has, okay? I believe financial information is some of the best data we have on our farm and the most piss poor used data we have. And yes, I said that frustrated, right? Does anybody care if their banker likes them because of their financial data? Oh, Jesus, you guys are gonna have long careers. You don't file taxes, you don't care what your banker thinks, right? Of course we do. Here's another question. How many people in the room can define what working capital and working capital as a percent of next year's expenses is and how it's calculated? So this time I actually believe the raise of shoulders. Not very many. There was a few though, which is awesome. This is why big data actually kind of pisses me off. It's because we've had access to some of the most important data to our operations for a hundred years and we haven't used it. That's not just farmers issues, right? There's a lot of consultants that deal with, with financial data that haven't done a good job of educating it either, right? They've just provided financial statements or tax returns, etc. And as farmers, we haven't asked for more, but I think it's an area our industry needs to improve. So on this slide, <clears throat> that's, that's a dashboard I get monthly from my CFO. And I, I realize a friend of mine calls it hashtag not normal. I'm an accountant that has an accountant. So I'm a recovering accountant that also employs an accountant. And uh, I believe I have one more page of this dashboard that's got some more details that I just didn't want up, but I can run any operation in the world from this dashboard. So what it does is the 82.67% is what I call the most important number in agriculture. That's my working capital as a percentage of ne next year expenses. So your working capital is calculated as current assets minus current liabilities, i.e. how much cash are you going to have in the next year? And then everybody in general has an idea of what their cost of production is. Let's call it $380 an acre. I have a good joke about that too. There's two types of farmers. There's farmers that have a cost of production over 350 and there's farmers that lie. So if someone tells you it's 200, they just don't know their number. Okay. So it's my, my, my working capital divided by next year's expenses. The reason I think that's so important is if that number gets under 50%, you need to start paying attention. If it gets under 35, you should probably talk to your banker before they decide to talk to you. If it gets under zero, you're in trouble. So bankruptcy actually isn't an issue in agriculture. Most of us are what, what Canada would define as a top 1% in equity and income. But insolvency is a huge issue because a lot of our money is tied up in assets that it's hard to pull cash out of. Or we're too stubborn to pull cash out of. If we get a piece of land paid off, we really don't want to remortgage it to fix working capital. So what do we do? Spend less on seed, fertilizer, and chem, which last time I checked kind of makes us money, right? It's like, I like a big engine, but I just don't want to pay for fuel. We laugh, but do you know how many times I see this happen? Right? There are three biggest expense pots, so we go to them first. So working capital, in my mind, is the most important number to do with data on your operation. More important than yield monitors, more important than anything. And you've had the data for a hundred years to calculate it. So I believe if you know working capital and debt service, you've actually flipped the relationship with your banker. They now work for you. They're like your vice president of finance. If you don't know those two numbers, you work for them. Because when they phone you and say, hey Christian, your working cap percent is at 10% and your debt service is under 1.25, like that's a problem. It's kind of like your mom yelling at you for your third time or your grandpa leaning back in his chair and giving you the stare. 
except worse because they can call the loan. So if you have a piece of paper and you take one thing home in the next, whatever we got left, 46 minutes or something, please calculate your working cap and please calculate it as a percent of next year's expenses. Because it is the most important piece of data you have. So debt service is what banks use to calculate whether or not you can make your loan payments. I'm going to tell you to Google the formula because I don't want to read it all out. But more or less, it's kind of like your cash net income, i.e. add back depreciation, etc., divided by principal payments. They want it at 1.25 in general or above. Okay? So that's important to know that number. It and working capital, they're the two numbers I want to know every single month, right? To know them accurately in agriculture, I have to do a value of growing crop, which on our farm is doable because it's 100% backed by an insurance contract. I know that number at all times, or at least the worst case, okay? So what else we have on that slide? Oh, I think I got a laser on here. I was going to use, oh, that's the blackout. Never mind. There we go. So in here is kind of our live valuation of crops at all times. We use contracts and price. If you want to have a nice little look, oh, growing crop inventory. So in here I have uh, 400 acres of barley still in the field at somewhere around zero and two bucks a bushel, just so that nobody else feels alone. Okay. Anybody else in the room for the first time in your life was more happy for New Year's than you were for Christmas? <laughs> Thank God for 2020. Okay, so here's the other thing I wish everybody would do. So this graph right here is my operating debt. So operating debt and operating kind of assets. This is building, asset, building assets, building debt, equipment assets, sorry, equipment debt, land assets, land debt. The number one thing we've let banks do in a lot of instances is put all that together. So you, we don't know how each asset class is levered, which then allows us to not borrow money for operating. We're using land equity to borrow operating money, and it all gets confused, and that's how you get insolvent. No different than you might be completely over levered on equipment and not even know the number. So work with your banker to get those asset classes split up so you know how each part of your operation is levered, and it'll add some clarity around your debt. Does anyone, like anyone lose the odd night of sleep to debt? Jesus, you guys are all stress-free. Nobody loses their hair in here. I'm asking questions I already know the answer to. My wife tells me they're my favorite questions. If you split it up like this, it'll make you feel better, right? Because it's not how much debt you have. It's what percentage of your asset value in each asset class you have that can cause stress. So then at the bottom is just some more of the ratios I want to see, right? Debt. Debt capacity is kind of to do with debt service, debt to equity, return on equity, and then what we have invested in capital assets and in equity per acre. And my belief is, with that dashboard, I could run any farm in the world. I'm not saying I could execute day to day on that farm, I could run it, right? So, as I said, we've had financial data forever, and we've underutilized it. So you don't have to spend any money on it, right? The one thing I hear about big data all these little knickknacks they want in my drill or my combine or my weather stations or my, it all costs money and I don't get anything back. FYI, 100 years of financial statements, you've already paid for them to tell you the truth to your accountant and to taxes and they sit in a beautiful little folder, right? So now we're on to labor power machinery. So as I said, I've seen the range of up to $200 an acre. And I kind of have two stories around this. Once again, kind of goes back to my theme on data. It's all about your mindset. So the first time I went down to TPAP, first day, actually the first day I got there, I was there a day early. And I was, I don't know what I was, 26 years old at the time. So I was pretty nervous to tell you the truth. Sit down for supper and Danny Kleinfelter sits down with me. He's the guy that started it all. If you haven't heard of Danny Kleinfelter, write his name down and Google him because he has probably the best articles on farm management in the world. And we're sitting there and talking about where we farm, and, and I've got to know him really well. He actually kind of neat sits on the advisory board for my farm now. We get talking about seeding 24 hours. And I give the typical Western Canadian answer. Like, 
Danny, do you not understand how many hours it's dark up here and how cold it is? And like, we have sloughs. This is not Illinois. Like, we don't go back and forth, straight rows, right? He looks at me and says, well, I work with a couple farms in North Dakota and South Dakota. How far is that from you? 60 miles. Oh. So what he did is he reframed the question. Christian, it's three years from now. You're seeding 24 hours. What did you do different? So, well, if I was going to do it, I need to hire at least one to two more people for a night shift, right? We'd probably need to take out some sort of tillage and go around sloughs and maybe the outside rounds so that they could see it better. Maybe buy a lot better light bar at the time because we didn't have these great LED lights and you're off the seat of your 9,600, 9,400 in the day trying to see far enough out if the ducks flying out were on water. And then we needed a really good plan for logistics. He says, oh, well, that actually didn't sound that hard. What's your problem? So I go home from TPAP that year, tell my dad. Dad might be more crazy about logistics than I am. He says, well, let's try it. Okay. So since 2008, I think is when I first went to TPAP, we've ran 24 hours pretty much every year, except 2011, because we seeded 90% of the farm with a Harrow Bar and a Valmar, and the whole field was water. So we didn't do it in that year. And we failed miserably a couple times. I've had, I've had humans, including myself, work 24 or 36 or 40 some hours without going to sleep. So don't think we didn't fail. But we've also had years where we had 10 or 11,000 acres on an 80 foot drill in 14 days. So all I did when I got home was the math around hiring one and a half humans and stretching a drill to 100 or 120 acres a foot versus say 70 to 80. And I was actually cheaper to hire the humans and I got them the other 100, 345 days of the year. Where the drill actually, does anybody else's drill kind of sit there from May 19th until April 28th the next year? Thank God there aren't a bunch of manufacturing companies in the room because if we told them we spent somewhere between a half million and a million bucks on a piece of manufacturing equipment, but we only hope to use it for 15 days, they look at us like we were crazy, right? So that's my story on mindset of equipment. The second is we do a bunch of work with deer on some prototype, but mainly on, on equipment utilization. And this was a project we did two years ago. So it's on, on R40, this is our R4045. This is on all of the R4045s in the black soil zone in North America. So then the interesting number was this one. 37.5% of R4045s have the nozzles on per hour. And we were able to hit 54.8. So think of the investment in a sprayer and how much different nozzle time has. And don't take this as, Christian, you're being arrogant because you're beating the average. Because I've seen this number as high as 71 on a couple of farms. And don't get me wrong. Some of the time it's because all their lands are really close to home. Right? And they only have, you know, 130 acres on their, or 1,130 acres to do. And they can be very timely. This number right here, we put 911 hours on our sprayer that year and hit 54.8. And we were at 59.8 this year. Our goal is to be over 65. We're not there yet. Most of it is just on proper planning of fill times. Number, there's a number one change. The second biggest change was shifts on our sprayers. As guys get more tired, they're less efficient. So one of my sprayer operators is even in the crowd. This year on our shift, we didn't have a main operator work over 50 hours in a week from seeding till harvest as the sprayers were running. And they were running from, what time were you starting, Kiwi? 4.30? 4.30 till 10 was what our sprayer shift was. Other than when we top dress, sometimes when we top dress, we all run 24 hours. So I only ran the sprayer for two nights. I think I maybe had seven hours on a sprayer this year but it was because our shifts would have been screwed up. So I just went and ran a night shift. And that's something we're proud of. To the point that we're trying to implement shifts for every month of the entire year. My farm manager has it broke down, he thinks, into five streams. Right? But if we want people to come work in agriculture, that's one of the, the nuances we have to fix. Right? Your job description can't be, you do what I tell you to do, when I tell you to do it, and when Mother Nature affects it. And then we wonder why... We can't keep people, right? 
Oh, yeah. So I had done the math on this. Uh, well, whatever. So on the sprayer, it had the cost per pass just by nozzle on time from about a dollar six per pass to over two dollars a pass just in the time the nozzles were on if you use the investment in the sprayer per acre. Investment, cost of money, etc., etc. So this slide's really hard to read. So you can tell Christian didn't do it. My CFO did. But what I'm going to point out is we pulled all our My John Deere data and started putting cost to stuff. So I'm going to read these out just, and this is for this year, which we were really wet, so I'd like to use the excuse that we were less efficient, but it still kind of sucks. Six, $69,000 is what it cost me for my combines for warming up, cooling down, and repair time. I.e., you know, the combine was on, but it wasn't full and it wasn't combining. And all we did was took those hours and used, I used 350 bucks an hour because that's kind of what a rental rate was and it's too hard to explain everyone's different combine costs. So I just used a flat rate. The second number, $4,000 is what I, it cost me for what I call inefficient grain carts, i.e. the combine sitting full idling. I don't know what my grain cart drivers deserve a handshake for that. Just over 22,000 acres and only cost me 4,000 bucks because a combine was sitting full. Glad my grain cart drivers aren't here today. They'd want another bonus. $46,000 is what it cost me to transport my combines. So that's the amount of time we were transporting at high idle and not combining. So if anybody can do the math on that, it's $101,000 of inefficiency. 22,000 acres. Let's use 20 to make our math easy. Five bucks an acre in combine inefficiency. And I think we focus on efficiencies quite a bit, actually. So hence why I use the word, the farms that are reasonable at data aren't reasonable. They're just less awful because a hundred grand is still pretty awful. So do you think this winter we're going to do some focusing on how to be more efficient on our combines? You bet. Now I'm not going to load them onto trailers to move them. We're still going to have transport costs. And, but for instance, we had this brainwave this spring that we'd run the drills in two separate fields instead of in the same field. We had all the reasons for it. It's a backwards idea. Once we put them in the same field, we got way more efficient, right? So just little changes that we make a mistake and then we learn and, and, and move forward. But part of it is if we didn't put the numbers to this, we would have never looked at it. You don't know what you don't know. Ron, did you hear that at TPAP this year? Right? It's a book called Thriving on Chaos. It's got four pieces of knowledge and the most important one, you just don't know what you don't know. And in agriculture, we're kind of stubbornly independent, which is a really good positive, right? It's how we beat the fall of 2019 because we are stubborn, right? And we find ways to win. But it's also our biggest negative because we do a bad job of telling each other the truth and talking. So this number gets even more powerful if my friend Ron does the exact same thing and we find out who's, who's, less, who's less awful on a per acre basis or a percentage basis of revenue. Then we, then we find out like, was Christian really inefficient? Or is he just like 10% off the industry average? Because right now I'm comparing it to perfect. And perfect's dangerous. Right? We call it the gap. One of my coaches calls it the gap. I'm going on a lot of tangents here. I think I got like 16 slides. Anyways. So the gap is called, pretend you get up in the morning and you start walking towards the sun. Okay? And at the end of the day, the sun goes down. Your goal was to get to the sun. So when the sun goes down, are you disappointed? Absolutely you are, right? You didn't get to the sun. But if all you did was turn around and look back how far you were from your house, you'd actually realize you did quite a bit that day. And that's what I mean where if I compared with Ron, I'd find out that the sun was a bad goal. And in fact, 20 miles from my house was a good goal. And, and we only got 16 miles. So we don't actually have that much to fix. We just got a little bit to fix. But if you don't look at it that way, you won't find it, right? So we're doing some work with a company called First Pass this year. So that's like AB line optimization. Yes, we have a lot of sloughs and bush in our, uh, in our area that we go around at times. But the other thing is we're finding as we have multiples of equipment, something as simple as what approach to start at, right? Where the grain, where you should split the field. I mean, it, do you know how much heartburn it caused me to take a section and cut it into quarters? Spent life trying to have mile long passes. And now with six combines, I got to split it into quarters to keep the grain cart efficient. 
Like I thought I was going to have a heart attack the first time we did it. It felt wrong. But it took the efficiency way up, right? And somebody else in the crowd will have a better way to do it than I do. I want to talk to you after. The other thing we found, though, is as machines show up at different times, they jump on the right AV line. So when you meet up, it's perfect. There isn't a foot overlap. Or Does it piss anybody else off when you're coming down the last pass and there's three feet of crop on a 40-foot header? Doesn't make anybody mad? It drives me crazy, right? And usually it's a three-foot pass to the far end of the field. <laughs> We've all been there. So, quick math on this. For our farm, it changed our one field by 8.89%. So we just split that, we just put that over our whole farm. About $43,000 of savings or 1,500 acres of work just by putting our AB lines in the right spot. I had never even fathomed it. The other thing is, is I thought people on my crew might not like it because it takes away some of the, you know, the decisions you get to make. Well, they loved it. Do you know how much your crew hates it? When they pick an AB line and someone's coming up beside them, and they're, they're a foot overlap and it screws up their next pass, pisses you off. It's like having a combine without foot rests. Combine drivers, you should have got that joke. Okay? That little bar there, it might be 120 bucks, but it's worth it. Okay? And, and as I talk about this stuff, I have no tie to any individual company, nothing. We farm. And we're looking for ways to be better and we try a lot of different stuff and we calculate whether or not it works for us, right? But AB, op, op, AB optimization is something I think is interesting. To the point that logistics optimization where your cell phone tells your trucks what road they should come into the field, what road they should leave and how far apart they should be spaced might get important. What about if our grain cart drivers got dinged three minutes before they had to be at a GPS location on a farm? Anyone in the room been frustrated at a grain cart driver? Any grain cart driver has been frustrated with a combine driver. Yeah, exactly. Right? There's been times where I phoned my grain cart driver and said, combine number one that's out in the back corner with his auger out, leave that goddamn combine there because until they figure out to get in the row, they don't get unloaded. Flying V, we call it. It's like the Mighty Ducks when we combine some days, right? Get in the flying V or get out of it. You just won't get unloaded if you're out of it, right? But those little frustrations are what we're trying to remove with technology, optimize people. So here's another one. Anyone else have a cab that looks kind of like this? Actually, as tech gets better, it gets way down. So it's getting better day by day. But I mean, this, ex this actually excites me, right? Just means I can make more decisions live. Some people it scares, but it's part of life. This side over here is, is another company we do work with. I think, Hachi, when are you So Ryan Hutchison's in the crowd. He's talking this afternoon in way more detail than I'm going to do. But it's, a, it's another company called, called Crop Intelligence we've been doing a bunch of work with that basically has a really fancy rain gauge with a four-foot soil probe. And what, what we've learned is that as farmers, we knew a lot about the top two inches of soil, and we knew nothing about the four feet underneath it. Okay? And yet we got roots, wick, and water at four feet by the mid to end of June in a lot of times, so it's pretty important which has then allowed us to run yield algorithms and yield predictions on how we should fertilize in the fall, how we should fertilize in the spring, how we're going to top dress. So now that data is letting us run pro formas and risk management, i.e. we don't put all the inputs out at the start because 240 pounds of nitrogen on canola kind of sucks if you don't need it. But if you do need it, I'm not going to be scared of it. Okay. And all I pulled on this slide to show was this was two falls ago. So it's about October, November. And if we got 50% of, of next year's precipitation, 75, 100, or 125, what our, what our absolute perfect case you know, yield target could be on each crop, which then allows me to start buying inputs. It allows me to start running pro formas on inventory. Maybe allows me to figure out what we should do for an equipment plan or a risk management plan or a working capital plan. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Is it leading us down a path where we want to go and fits our value system? Absolutely. So there's a whole bunch of companies that do this kind of work. So this is Farm Command, Farmer's Edge, FBN does a bunch of this, Climate View is now doing a bunch of this. As I said, I'm not company specific, I just point out the pieces of data that I like. So what this one's showing is the yield trend per pound of nitrogen on 233P. This is 80 to 100 pounds. 
This is 180 to 220. 33 up to 51 bushels on a field average. So it's showing that there's pretty part of positive ROI right up to a 50 bushel crop. Three pounds on a 50 bushel crop, 150 pounds in. But your whole field doesn't need it, just the areas that are going to run really run 50, right? But is, does anybody else in the room have areas in your field that run 80 to 100 and then areas that run 50 and then areas that run zero and somehow it averages 50? So then our plan, how I talked about capping or, or handcuffing the top 60%, to me is our biggest issue to get to the Canola Council's yield goal, is we have to unleash that top part of the field, right? So all I'm saying with this data is, once again, you don't know what you don't know. And I don't know about any of you guys, but the only way I can out-yield a neighbor at the coffee shop is to let him tell me first. <laughs> okay? So unless you can find a way to gather some of this and aggregate it, because I just care about one field versus one field, right? I want 5,000 fields versus 5,000 fields all in the black soil zone. Then the data is useless. Because has anybody else seen a yield monitor out by 10, 15, 20, or 100%? I have. So unless you aggregate that data and pull the curves off the two ends, pardon my French, it's pretty shitty data. And I don't like, like making decisions on bad data. So return on investment. Let's get into some details. This is once again crop intelligence data. This was uh, 2017. 2017, yep. So this is, the, this is all the data we're getting from our soil probes. Blue is rain events, right? The, uh, the, the red is our yield potential. So if you can imagine, when we get rain, my yield potential goes up. It's kind of cool, right? The yellow bars are the normal rainfall we get on a 30-year average, okay? So in 2017, we were running at 45% of normal rainfall at the time we would normally top dress our wheat, okay? So I can still remember the day because one of my best friends told me I walked into soccer practice, and uh, this was one of the years I was in the sprayer a fair bit helping the guys at top dress time because we were trying to run 24 hours. So I had a beard, which, like a beard on a bald guy looks pretty funny. People remember when you have a big beard. Big black eyes under my, under, my, uh, under my hat and walk up to all the soccer dads. And my buddy said to me that, Christian, you look like hell. What's going on? Oh, we're top dressing. 10 gallons an acre, 6,000 acres. At doing it at night, spraying during the day. It's crazy. But the, the weather stations are saying we got lots of rain. Like we got lots of moisture in the four feet. And odds are, last week of June... We get rain in Mooseman. So we're doing it. He said he can still remember I wasn't 10 feet away. And one of the other guys looks at him and says, not only has he lost his hair, he's lost his mind. He's crazy. There's cracks in the ground we can stick our hands in. Okay? But the year before that, I didn't have this data. I didn't know what was going on below the ground. And we did get rain that weekend. So the way it turned out, that year was 11 bushels, about a point and a half of protein. So $162 an acre is what our wheat made us over all our checks. So we left, my sprayer guys don't always like it, but we pretty much have a check strip in every single field, right? For about three years, and then once three years convinces me, then we get over check strips. And I had no idea that that was possible until we had that data, i.e. I didn't know, right? And you can't change if you don't know. But once again, theme of the presentation, data is absolutely useless unless you can make a decision from it. To make a decision, you have to trust it, one. And two, it has to be in an intelligent enough form that you can make a decision. So if they were to send me just all of this stuff in hundreds of pages of printed graphs, and I didn't have this nice little line that showed me my yield potential which is plus 17 bushels an acre over what I put down for spring nutrients. It would be right beside my old yield monitor binder, right? It's kind of like, I think they should put towel racks on the fronts of treadmills. That's how, use, that's how useless my yield data was. Kind of like my treadmill is most days except the first couple of weeks of January, right? So top 60% of the field, we've been doing a whole bunch of work on 
planters, planters' widths, planters versus air seeders, or, or planters versus controlled spillage. It's usually what we call air seeders, right? We'll just blow this all through a two-inch line, take it down to a one-inch line, and hope it ends up somewhere accurate on an eight-foot wide strip by a mile long, right? And we found some interesting data. So in general, our, our planter at our low out yields our air seeder. The issue we found so far is we can get nowhere near 100 acres a foot on a planter yet in our area. We've got a lot of fist-sized rocks, right? It's fairly frustrating for myself and my crew running the planter. But a pound and a half to two pounds less seed rate and three to four bushels an acre is still enough to make us keep trying. Is it going to be the, the way of the future? No. I don't know. It might be a seed disc like that on, a, on one of our drill openers that does accurate seed placing. The only kicker is, is I'm not sure the amount I've learned about packing in the last two years, I think it's as much to do with how our packing works as it is about how our seeds are split apart. But once again, I wouldn't have known if we hadn't have tried. It is pretty cool for the farmers in the room. If you haven't used the planter yet, that little disc right there, when you go check the seed behind your planter, say you've set a plants per, plants per acre at whatever number you want for 2.25 inches of spread, like, they'll be between 2 inches and 2.25 inches every time. And my dad says it's like when Grandma used to plant the garden and just push the corn seed down in with her thumb. It's how every single one of them looks. Right? Pretty neat for those of us that love growing crops. So the other thing I wanted to talk about on data that really is not hard to implement, right? So I'm trying to come up with some pretty cheap options that you can just take home and do this winter when you have a bit of time. Haha, <laughs> Christian, we didn't get anything done in the fall of 19. Where are you finding time? We're not, don't worry. But here's a few things we've implemented on the farm that are pretty simple. So this app right here is almost the lifeblood of our farm. It's called Voxer. So it's a messaging app. Works from iPhones, Androids, computers. Works really good for groups of people. So we have a whole team group. So I have some great girls in the crowd right now that plan team lunches for us and and corral all of us crazy people to get in for a team lunch, right? It goes out on the whole farm chat, right? We have a trucking chat, so only the truckers find out about trucking, not everybody else. Because we live in a world of distractions. So if you're not on the trucking crew and you get all the trucking chat and something goes wrong, what's the first thing that happens? You feel guilty and you go to help. But what if they didn't need help, right? And we have a seeding chat and a spraying chat, right? We have a parts chat where the parts get ordered on so that that guy always knows what gets ordered and what gets picked up. Do we follow it all the time? No. We try to. We're trying to get better. I got this speech called the 5% rule, so I just keep telling myself if we take baby steps one day, it'll fix itself, right? Okay? The problem is, is we change so much, i.e. everybody changes so much, it's hard to ever fix it completely. So Voxer is a really neat one to help with communication. We basically have got rid of intercompany emails partially because most of our farm ops crew hate email, and secondly, because Christian's really bad at checking emails. Okay? Voxer, I'm actually pretty good at most of the time. T-sheets. So I've had a lot of people over the years ask me about time clocks and payroll. And Anyone in the room love doing payroll and tracking hours? I didn't think there was any crazy people, except there's one up in the front here that actually enjoys it. She works for me. <laughs> okay? T-Sheets syncs completely with QuickBooks Pro online, but it's an app on your phone. You clock in and out from your phone. It geo-references people. So yes, I'm not going to lie to you. We've caught people clocking in at home. Makes it pretty easy to have a conversation. Hey, right? You don't work in Mooseman. You work at Fairlight, right? The other thing, though, is we now, Mariah now sends us a report every Friday of where every team member is on our hours. Because if we're going to start to move to shifts and, and believe in work-life integration, we need to be reminded, right? Because as farmers, what do we enjoy? Getting stuff done, right? But we also want our team to have good lives. We just sometimes forget to check on that very often. Really easy way to do payroll, to track hours, etc. And cheap. So Google, everybody that works for us, has a G Suite account, so we have a Hebert Grain Ventures web page and our email is Hebert Grain Ventures. This is the email, this is the calendar, okay? Everybody that works for us has a Hebert Grain Ventures email. 
They have a Heber Grain Ventures calendar, right? Do all of them use it? No. Does the office team use it intensively? Yes. Can any of my team go onto my calendar and see where I am on a work basis on a day-to-day? You bet they can. Do they do it that often? No, but they will occasionally. We also use Google Drive a ton. All of our invoices are kept in Google Drive and then synced to the books. So we can have people, you know, my wife will get a whole bunch of the email, take pictures of all of it, put it in Google, Google, Google Drive and label it the way we want it. All of a sudden our controller can access it from the farm. Less lost data. And there's other apps that'll do that, HubDoc, etc. We just use Google for everything. Uh, does anybody hate the amount of passwords nowadays? Oh, you guys never forget passwords, it's just me. This is an app called One Password that you can share with your team. So for all your My John Deere, etc. stuff, they can go in and you can have all your team passwords in there. It uses face recognition. So all your passwords, you just got to look at your phone. You don't have to type the damn thing in every time and then forget it every three weeks. Right? Okay. Good little app. Last one's Trello. So it's a project management app. We're less awful at it than some people. We still have so much we could do on it. But it's a card-based system that basically moves from the left side of your screen to the right side. So the left side would be all the things we need to do, right? And as you move across, it's to done. We use it really good in the office because my office team has high follow-through and, and likes stuff like that. And we're pretty poor at it on the farm because we're a bunch of quick starts that like to use our hands, not necessarily look at technology. But it helps. And day after day, we get better at it. We have equipment cards in Trello. So you could, it doesn't matter where you are getting parts. You could go into this Trello app on your phone and know the serial number of every tractor, when we bought it, you know, the main oil filters, the main belts, etc. The main repairs we've ever done are tracked in there. You can see all that just on your phone. doesn't matter who it is on the farm. Unless all of you, every time you go get to parts, the parts people are the best people you've ever met in your entire life. You don't even have to ask them a question. They find it in three seconds. Jesus, I need to move and farm where you guys do. So. So let's go back to the mentality, right? Anybody in the room watch the, sh- the movie Moneyball? Most people have probably. It's kind of like Blackjack, right? They use data analytics to win the World Series. Right? They didn't have the biggest budget, so they wanted to use a smaller budget, make better decisions to do better than everybody else. Does that sound like farming? We want to spend less money to make better decisions and be the most profitable slash do the best job on our land. Yeah? There's why data is important if we analyze it and make decisions, right? But the two statements I always talk about is one, has anybody ever heard, I mean, of course this never gets said anymore, but if it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Everybody's heard that line, right? It's going just fine, leave it alone. So I truly believe You guys are in this room, you're at Ag Days to learn, you have some of the best operations in North America. Probably even the best at, if let's just pretend farming is only 100 decisions, some of the best at the average of those 100 decisions. But I also fully believe that someone somewhere in the world is kicking your ass at every single individual decision. And so do you have a mentality that my average outcome is pretty good? Or that if it's not broke, I just haven't looked hard enough. Because someone somewhere is doing it better than I am. And it's one of the main things we try and show the crew because, guess what? Most of my crew is going to be in at the the show the next two days. You know what they're going to come back with? An easier way to change a sprayer tire, right? Fix an air conditioner, organize parts. I haven't changed a sprayer tire in three years. Should I be making the decision on how to change a sprayer tire? No. I, you need input and you need a team that's always looking for ways to do things better, right? And you have to be open-minded enough that they know, you're not going to say yes to every little gadget, it costs money, but they're open-minded enough to know that you are going to change the things that cause a lot of pain and help efficiency if that's the thing you're living, right? So we had to talk about one of our air seeders. It's our older air seeder. You know, it got a bit, everyone kind of complained about it a little bit in spring, but the two main operators and I sat down and said, what's the real problem? The heads suck. The fertilizer plugs in the heads at night when the dew comes out. Okay, well, there's a big difference between replacing the heads and replacing an air seeder. So today and tomorrow, we'll try and find better heads. It'll cost us 5,000 bucks instead of 220,000. 
But that's just, you have to be willing to listen and take advice on, on things that your crew's way better at than you. I mean, you, you don't hire smart people and then tell them what to do. You hire smart people and listen, right? If I hire, if I hire as people that are good at the things I do, that means all I get to do is all the stuff I don't like, right? So, why does it matter to have a strategy, to have a data strategy, and to care about data analytics? That's the Stats Canada data on how many farms there are in Canada. So, in 1941, we hit a high of about 750,000. I haven't pulled the newest data, but in 2011, we were down to about, about 170,000. The only issue is that 105,000 of those have less than $100,000 in revenue. So I call that a hobby. So there's about 65,000 of us left. From somewhere in 1941, I actually believe they were all organizations that allowed their family to survive. So we are going extinct. So what's your advantage to not go extinct, right? Everybody raise your hand to this if you believe in it, but how many people in this room would be really happy if your farm turned into a legacy farm and went on for a couple more generations? Best raise of shoulders I got all day, right? But in order to do that, we can't be one of these farms, right? We have to care about the stuff other people don't care about. Quick math on this and an interesting little exercise when you're driving home today, count up how many yard sites you farm. So go back to, dad and I like to use 1982, Dennis, because that was one of his first crops. How many yards, how many farmers would have been farming our farm in 82? It'll scare you, just so you know. So I talked about having a mindset. This is kind of our legacy statement. So Maverick Egg is a new company I started in the spring. Basically, I rolled out, I did a bunch of consulting and I rolled it out to a person that's better at than me to hopefully help the kind of financial business risk management and consulting side of agriculture and, and with some of this data stuff. But the one I'm going to focus on today is Heber Grain Ventures. That's our farm. So our legacy statement, and pretty much everybody on our team, I'm not saying they could recite it word for word, but we'd be pretty close, is that we want to leave the dirt, the financial statements, the team members, the community, and the industry in a better state than the last generation. So we don't want the highest profit and to take all of the P&K out of our land we don't want our communities to fail, right? It's all together. Lastly, I don't believe you can have a strategy or make any change or be willing to know what you don't know if you don't have a reason to do it, right? So we just, I just threw pictures up, but that's my reason to get up every morning and I think everybody in the room has it, right? I always joke, I wanna give the kids the opportunity to go to Harvard. And I don't care if it's Harvard, it could be Stanford or Cornell, a top-notch university, and build something cool enough side-by-side side with the job offer out of New York or Calgary or Regina, right? Do I want them to come home? Not enough that I would force them to ever. But I want it to be side-by-side side with that other great opportunity, right? And if I stand still, the chances of that are zero. So that would be kind of my, my pitch today, right? Find your why of why you get up every morning. Also remember them why you should go home at night, right? We work to live, not the other way. Focus on financial data because you already have it. It's free. And you don't know what you don't know. So have a data strategy to figure out the areas you can improve your operation. And that's all I got. I think I only got like two minutes for questions, but I'd take them. And I'm around the show all day. So. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, very much, Christian. A good hand of applause, please, for this presentation. I will take a couple of questions. Uh, I know we're tight for time here, but I'll allow a couple of questions if we have some from the audience. Raise your hand, please. Oh, come on. There must be a question out there. Makes it easy. I have one. In today's economy, where we're at today, what's, and I'm not sure if that's a question we can answer, but what is an optimum size farm today? We're talking about optimizing and so on. So what would be, in your mind, in your, in your view, what would be an, optimize, an optimum size yeah. farm? So, I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm going to generalize a bit because every area is different. 
So I'm not an acres guy. I don't care how big or how small farms are. I've seen small farms really profitable and big farms really profitable. So I think, first of all, decide if you're a, like a commodity type farmer or a niche type farmer. So niche farmers would be more like the vegetables, etc. They don't need as many acres. For the commodity type farmers, I think it's optimal sized units. So in a lot of Western Canada, that unit falls around 8,000 acres. 80 foot drill, one sprayer, two combines. But it's how your equipment fits into your, your farm size that actually affects profitability in a lot of cases and how those strategies all fit together, right? Your, your cash and your debt to your equipment to your execution. Thank you. Did that trigger somebody's question, a question in somebody's mind in the meantime? No? Any last words, Christian? That's it for today. Enjoy the show. Very good. Thank you very much, everyone.